So uh, um, I want to start today um, by um, with a question. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? Maybe this is something that, that you've asked yourself, but uh, just for a little, little context, um, way back when, actually even before my time, there was a great singer by the name of Peggy Lee. And in 1969, Peggy Lee had a hit song called, Is That All There Is? And so I just want to quickly just kind of read you those, uh, those lyrics. The song goes like this. She says, I remember when I was a very little girl, our house caught on fire. I'll never forget the look on my father's face as he gathered me up in his arms and raced through the burning building out to the pavement. I stood there shivering in my pajamas and watched the whole world go up in flames. And when it was all over, I said to myself, is that all there is to a fire? And then she goes into the chorus. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball if that's all there is. And she goes on. And when I was 12 years old, my father took me to a circus, the greatest show on earth. There were clowns and elephants and dancing bears. And a beautiful lady in pink tights flew high above our heads. And so I sat there watching the marvelous spectacle. I had the feeling that something was missing. I don't know what, but when it was over, I said to myself, is that all there is to a circus? Chorus, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's uh, all there is, my friends, and let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is. Then she says, I fell in love, head over heels in love with the most wonderful boy in the world. We would take long walks by the river or just sit for hours gazing into each other's eyes. We were so very much in love. Then one day he went away and I thought I'd die, but I didn't. And when I didn't, I said to myself, is that all there is to love? And then she goes into the chorus. Let's break out the booze and have a ball. That's all there is. I know what you're saying. Must be saying to yourself, she says, if that's the way she feels about it, why doesn't she just end it all? Oh, no, not me. I'm in no hurry for the final disappointment. For I know just as well as I'm standing here talking to you, when that final moment comes and I'm breathing my last breath, I'll be saying to myself, if that is all there, all there is, is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball. If that's all there is. Interesting enough, I think there should be another stanza that says, if that's all there is, is breaking out the booze. If that's all there is, is dancing. If that's all there is, is to have a ball. What is there to do? Now, we, all, we don't usually see this kind of honest reflection in the world. Is that all there is? Because, uh, quite frankly, most of us, most of the world's trying to avoid this question. Because whatever they say today, this is it. They understand that a week, a month, a year from now, you will go, is that all there is? Is that all there is? All the political promises, no matter who wins, I guarantee you, if it's the person you love, a year from now you're going to go, is that all there is? Really, all that? Bloviating and this is what we get? I can guarantee you in life, there will be some great times, but eventually the things that you thought were awesome and wonderful, you will stop and you'll say, is that all there is? Interesting enough, most folks now actually believe there is something more, but that is more based on a feeling and a wish than, a, than a, really a philosophy that people really believe in. I know this because they don't live that way. They die that way. I have not ever been in a memorial service where people didn't talk about heaven, ever. And I've been to some very secular uh, uh, memorial services, and you know, it may be, hey, man, that guy's up there having a beer with God right now. But man, <laughs> he's with God. There's something more. But you could just tell in the room there is no oxygen because everyone, deep down, if they let themselves, they, they'll usually don't, but if they let themselves, they're thinking, is that all there is? I had the privilege this week, um, in the last seven or so days, um, to spend some time with Tom Green. 
Um, Tom, in a lot of ways, was blessed. Um, those of you who, who knew him know that I'm speaking truth here. He was told years ago that he was dying soon. And they began to make uh, plans for that. And then God gave him years and years of health. Always, though, with this thing of my, the clock is ticking. I mean, we all know this, but there's some of us that know it a little bit better than others. And Tom used that time. He used that time wisely. And so when I got to sit with him, it was just, it's, it's, I cannot tell you, you probably haven't had the, uh, as many experiences. This might be a good thing to sit with folks in those final days and those final hours. But I have, just because my role as a pastor, nothing special about me. But there is something completely different with someone who has a different answer to this question. Is that all there is? It, 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 the, the conversation, now, don't get me wrong. Tom, if God had given him the deal, would have st stood around a little longer. But that wasn't because he wasn't unsure of what was to come. It was because he loved his family and thought maybe I could take care of him a little bit more. It was, it was about them. As a matter of fact, his last week, that's what he told the doctors. We're done. We, we think this is time. I don't, I don't want to worry about, I don't want any treatment that will take me away from communicating with people of how valuable they are, what a blessing they've been to me, and about what's coming next. And that is how he spent his time. And it was, it was different. It was absolutely different. Because he had a different perspective on, is that all there is? In effect, the passage that we're going to go uh, over today, you know, right, we finish with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We just move on right now to 15. And in essence, um, Paul is going to address this question. He's going to, in essence, say here, faith without the resurrection is worthless. In other words, if all you have is some kind of religion in this lifetime and then it's done, you're wasting your time. Can you imagine a pastor saying that? I have to, because that's, in essence, what we're going to see in the text today. Faith without the resurrection. And he's not just talking about the resurrection of Christ, though he'll link that. Your and I's resurrection is worthless. Now, um, we, uh, you may not remember this, but uh, in Easter, we actually went through verses 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and he, basically, Paul comes and says, hey, I want you to know the good news. Here's the good news. And he basically says that Christ, four things, died for our sins. That's the reason he went to the cross. Somebody needed to pay for that, and we couldn't do it ourselves. So Christ died for our sins. He was buried. In other words, he was really dead. But then he was raised, and then he was seen by a bunch of people to prove that he had been raised from the dead. Right? You'll, you'll, if you want to go and, and you, have, you miss that message, you can kind of think, oh, I'd like to know, hear that one. I want to hear all of 1 Corinthians. Right? You can go back online. It will be online for you to do that. But then he moves on here in, in verse 12, and he kind of says, he just addresses the question. If that's true, that's what we say the good news is, then how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? How can some of you go around saying, you know what? There's really not life after. Or even a truncated, right? And that is just your spirit moves on. It's this, it, you know, joins the consciousness. It is kind of free flowing kind of a kind of a kind of a thing. And Paul says in in contrast to what we were teaching you, the faith that you have, how in the world can you say this? So again, let's pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, verse 12. Paul writes, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him. In fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. You can kind of see the theme here. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those who have uh, fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have the hope in Christ, we are of all people must be pitied. So let's just take this, net, uh, uh, this apart a little bit. Obviously, the, the main idea here is, is this question. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. 
especially considering that is, that is like the cornerstone of what we've been preaching. It's not how can the world say that. It's that how can those of you who have supposedly faith in Jesus say that? How can you endorse that philosophy? Right? And then he, he kind of goes on to kind of make his, his point. Right? And in, in, uh, in, this is twice. So the first time he says, if there's a resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. All right. So if you're saying that, that there is there you here, you live and then you're just gone. There is no bodily resurrection. Then he says, and that, that also applies to Christ himself. And then he gives a result of that. If that applies to Christ, then first of all, let me just tell you, our preaching is useless. We're wasting our time. He's just admitting it. If Christ did not raise from the dead, we're wasting our, our, our time. And if you go back to uh, uh, listen to the uh, Easter one, that's in, in fact the point. The point is, if you want to undo Christianity, just undo the resurrection. Once that's undone, the whole thing falls apart. And Paul agrees. It's useless. And by the way, he says, not only is the preaching useless, but your faith, which is based on the preaching, is also useless. Why? Because you have faith that Jesus did something for you. And the result of that was that you were back in relationship with God. But if, if he's not raised from the dead, then, then quite frankly, he was like any other sacrifice. Remember, they used to make sacrifices for their sins of animals. The problem is, is that covered up maybe, and it just really covered over, didn't get rid of it, covered over that one sin. Because the animal, the animal could only die once. If Christ is just like that, you're still stuck in your sins. The reason it's important that he raised from the dead is that then he was God in flesh and God crucified for you who continues to live. is a completely different story. Your faith then has something. But without that, your faith is what he says, useless. And then he admits, too, we're also false witnesses. Why? Because they went around saying Christ is risen from the dead. This is, by the way, one of the things, the hardest things for those who study this to say that um, Christ did not raise from the dead. is because every single person, hear me. Every single person recorded in history who saw, and that's really important, who saw Jesus, or it's claimed they saw Jesus after he raised from the dead, every single one of them stuck to that story till the day they died, and many of them died gruesomely because of that story. Not once said, all right, all right, you're right, it's a lie, you know, we made it up because, you know, we wanted all these riches, which if you know anything about the disciples. There was none of that anyhow. And he said, but he basically says, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, then, then we're speaking in truth. In other words, here's another excuse why you don't have to listen to us. And then he repeats the same thing again. He says that if for the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And then he gives a few more examples of them. Then your faith is futile. You're wasting your time is the translation. It will produce Nothing. This is one of the reasons I, I honestly don't understand uh, folks today that call themselves churches, but they don't really believe the Bible. They just think Jesus was a good person and he was someone to follow. Because the, the, Paul is saying, the scriptures are cl clear, if that is all we have, you're wasting your time. It's either divine and something amazing or he's just another person with some good advice that you could take and you can't take. But it sure is not worth suffering over. It's sure not worth centering your life around. It's futile, is what he says. It's futile. Not only that, he says, you're still in your sins. And like I just explained, it, it, a, a, a person who died for sin and is, no longer exists, is gone, doesn't even cover my sin, let alone yours. He says, you're still in your sins. And not only that, but those like Tom Green and those that you know who followed Jesus, that put their faith in that, they're lost. They're, there's, there's nothing else for them. And then he concludes this way, just to kind of put a fine point on it. Right? He, he basically concludes, he says, um, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. In other words, if this is just a religion, a philosophy for this life. He says, we of all people must be pitied. You should feel sorry for us. 
Now you gotta understand, there's an American version of Christianity that's, that basically says this, that basically says, God sent Jesus and now all the stupid stuff you've ever done in your life, you don't have to worry about. Um, and now you can live the American dream, okay? In the first century, no one lived the American dream that was following Jesus. They were, they were persecuted. It, it, they refused to eat the meat that was offered to idols in a lot of cases. They couldn't do business with folks because of their beliefs. They were like a lot of the, by the way, a lot of the church around the world today, they were persecuted. And so you would be, if all you had was this life, your faith did not produce the, the American dream riches that we say it, that we say it produces. So you were an idiot for giving up all that. I would, be, I would be the chief idiot among us. I can't tell you how much time I, I, just, I could easily get another job in the Bay Area and make more money. Though, quite frankly, I would move to the country. Away from people. I wouldn't have to deal with people anymore. <laughs> right? I'd love ministry if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> no, ser seriously. We should be, the, the things that we give up, if this is it, just understand what Paul is saying. This, this idea that, that you can have this Christian philosophy and it just makes you feel good about yourself and a good person. He doesn't buy into that at all. He's saying because faith is something that you step out and it costs you something. And why in the world would you live a life of, of self-sacrifice, of persecution, of saying no to yourself, let alone saying no to what the world says, for nothing. For nothing. So, so your friends and family and, and those that you, in your circles that you know that, are, that, that um, don't believe in God, and they're just like, Peggy Lee, if that's all there is, drink the booze, let's dance, let's party. Paul, we're going to find, is in actually agreement with them. That's actually not stupid. It's, it's the end result. It's a logical result. Then he goes on, and he's going to talk about what I call the theology of the resurrection. Now, I know theology is a big word. We don't go around you know, talking about, what's your theology? What's your theology? It's not a daily word. But all, all it means is the study of God. And there's some things about God and some truths that he just wants to establish, that he wants us to make sure that we understand. Verses 20 through 28. Let me just read the 20 through 26 first. But God, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have been fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. And when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay, so here's the things that he wants you to know about God. Number one, Christ has, in fact, been raised from the dead. In fact, he, he calls Christ the first fruit of many who will rise. So in the, in the Jewish tradition, the, the first fruits is, um, is the first part of the harvest uh, that faithful Jews bring to the temple as an offering. It was, it was required. It's that 10% kind of idea. As soon as you harvest, you take 10% and you take it to the temple. It's the first fruits, right? It's, it's, a, it's the same thing for those of you who, who are uh, tithe in this way, right? I don't, I, as soon as I get my paycheck, the first 10% is sent to ministry right away. Don't, don't even think about it. And then after that, God might ask for more. He may or may not. But the first fruit is his. And so what, he, what he's saying is, is that Christ, in fact, was the first fruit of this salvation, the first resurrection. Now, he's not actually technically the first resurrection. Lazarus, remember, he raised Lazarus from the dead. But he is the first eternal resurrection. And what we're going to find out next week in, ter uh, in terms of the eternal body as, as well. So he is, he is the first fruit. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And then, and then he kind of says, okay, this is, what, this is how you, I want you to process. There's a truth I want you to know, right? And he talks about, he kind of, he goes back in the scriptures. And he says, in the very beginning, God creates man and woman. And remember, they were without shame before God. They were without shame of each other. Uh, but they also had the opportunity to love. And love means you have a choice. You have to have a choice. If you don't have a choice, you can't love. 
Okay? But with that choice, they decided to A, not love God, and A, not love each other, and then the result was shame. And from then on, flesh was corrupt. And now our flesh is, is driven by a desire to destroy itself. Now, let me just give you the best example I can at this point of what he's talking about. Some of you may notice I might be a little thinner than I have been in quite a while. I can take no credit for this whatsoever. The reason I'm thinner is they gave me a medication for, for my diabetes, and the side effect of that was I lost my appetite. Okay, I lost my appetite. Which, by the way, is, was a completely new experience for me. I have never not been hungry. Ever in my life. Ever in my life. Until, until I had, all of a sudden I, 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 I took a medication and uh, um, I, I will have a plate, and it's a small plate even. I have three dollar sized pancakes on it, and I eat one, I'm like, I'm done. That is so unusual. I can't believe that some of you, that's the way you always live. You actually get full. You are so lucky. Now, in essence, using that analogy, God, that's how God created humanity. God created humanity to love, to feel like putting their uh, lives down for each other and, for, and to feel like putting their lives down for God. And it's you first, not me first. But when sin happened, all of a sudden, everybody got that appetite, your flesh got the appetite I have, which is just consume, consume, consume. And it doesn't really matter what anyone tells you about what you're, what's happening to your body, your mind, and all that kind of stuff. You just have this craving to, and to say no, you're just fighting this craving each time. So I'm either going to wrestle against all the weight or I'm going to wrestle against my brain going, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Right? So what he's saying is, is, is that that hunger to destroy yourself, to just consume, to make yourself feel good, even though it's not good for you, that came when Adam and, and Eve, but really he's pointing to Adam now, the dude, not the, not the gal. From, it, death entered in through that decision right there. But just as it entered in through one person, he says, there's an opportunity for you to get that appetite, if you would, where, it's, where God originally created it, where you're not trying to destroy yourself. That opportunity comes through Christ. Through him, all people are made alive. He says, understand this point. And then he, and then he goes on to say, uh, the order, if you would, of the resurrection of how things are happening. He, he says this in verse 23, but each in turn, but each in turn. In other words, each of these things happens. And so he gives us the order of how things happen. First, Christ rose from the dead. He was the first one to receive this eternal resurrection, Right? Then he's going to say that those who belong to Christ, now notice this is a qualifier, not everyone, those who belong to Christ, they also will experience resurrection. They will receive, but it won't happen until Christ returns, his second, his second coming, if you would, right? And then at that time when Christ returns, he says at that time, the end will come. He's going to say a little bit about the end. We'll get there. And then he says, at that end, during that end, guess what? The last enemy destroyed will be death itself. In other words, resurrection will be complete. There will be no other death after that time period. Wow. Wow. In the midst of this, he says, I, I, he kind of gives us some information about when the end comes. When the end comes, he says that um, Christ, in essence, um, uh, he says that the, uh, God will hand over the kingdom. Um, I'm sorry. Christ will hand over the kingdom to God. In other words, in, initially, he kind of explains that, that Christ has to have all dominion, all authority, all power. In other words, he needs to become the ruler of the entire earth. And he will reign over the entire earth until everyone and everything is put under his feet. But that at that time, going back to the original uh, thought, Christ... Who, who, during this last reign, when all earth is then subject to him, all his enemies are subject to him, he will turn around and say, the kingdom is yours to the Father, to Father God. And then he kind of he unpacks this a little bit in, the, in, the, uh, in verses 27 and 28. He says this, um, For he, being God, has put everything under his feet, meaning Jesus. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, 
who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. All right? So what he does is he quotes here the last half of Psalm 8, 6. That's the has put everything under his feet. He goes back to the Hebrew scriptures. He says, there's an idea here. There's a theme that you see where God puts all things under the Messiah's feet. It's all subject to him. Okay? But then he wants to clarify. Now, but understand this, that ultimately, I'm not saying that God himself, God the Father himself is subject to Christ. But everything else, both on this earth as well as spiritually, will be subject to Christ. And once this happens, he says, the Son himself, um, who is Jesus, he will subject himself to the Father, who put everything under him. Now, this is a beautiful, uh, this is actually a beautiful picture. It's not a picture of, well, Jesus isn't really God then. What it's a picture of is that, is that Jesus is showing you and I um, Someone who does not feel um, it's something to have equality with God, that he subjects, his, again, it's an example, he subjects himself to the Father and the Father's plan. That's what it's a picture of. Again, this isn't, this isn't value. It's, it's in terms of this is how Christ's final example, of this is how we live with our lives subject to God. He is the ruler. He is the king. That's why I always argue, folks, who reject God now are also going to see heaven and go, oh, I'm in now. Because heaven is not just a great place. Heaven is a place for those who willingly desire to say no to themselves and yes to God's leading and majesty and, and king for all time. And if that's not what you want, that would be hell, being forced to do that. And, that, and that's what he says of it. And the whole... It all comes together that God may be the all in all. In other words, that God may be all to everyone. Christ sets that example, and then we follow him example because that is what eternity is about. It's not, remember, I always say, heaven is not a reward for the good. We are no, none of us are good. Jesus is kind of good. Yeah. Heaven is a place for God's children who want him to be daddy, master, king forever of their lives. That's what heaven is for. And then he kind of goes back to this idea, but then how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Verses 29 through 32. Again, he says, Now if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about... You in Christ Jesus, O Lord, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So again, he goes back to this idea is, if Christ is not raised, then. So if there's no resurrection, then. Here's the result. Okay. Now this first part, this is why a lot of folks don't teach 1 Corinthians, because this first part is head-scratching. Okay? What we know to be true is this. He says, if the dead are not raised, why are people being baptized for them? So here's the, here's the idea. Well, we know this, is, this, we know this much. The Corinthians have some folks in their family or friends or whatnot that, that obviously followed Jesus um, or were thinking about following Jesus, and they died before they were baptized. Remember, baptism is, the, is one of the first steps of obedience when you decide to follow Jesus. You know, get your life together and then baptize. You say, I believe, I trust him, and I'm going to obediently show you I trust him by being baptized. All right? They missed that step. And so some people, and supposedly somebody in the church, would say, okay, baptize me in the name of whoever that person is. Okay? Now, nowhere in church history, especially the early church, is this practiced. We don't see this in anywhere. And most people avoid this verse because it's really tough because that's not what we do, right? Um, the be my best guess, and now I'm using the word guess. So I'm not teaching you I know this is absolutely true. But my best guess is this, that um, um, baptism is only a symbol of what happened in your heart. And it, just because if you receive Jesus and on their way to the baptistry, you get hit by a truck, God's not going to go... Phew. You didn't get in the water. Sorry, you don't get in. 
Now, I think baptism is important because it's a step of obedience, but I don't, think it, I don't think it trumps the physical act trumps the heart, which is really what matters. Right? After all, the thief on the cross that Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise, was never baptized. And as far as we know, nobody was baptized for him. Okay, so I don't, I don't think Paul thinks it matters, that this practice matters. That's not what he's pointing to me. But what he's making is this. You are saying there's no resurrection. Then why in the world would you go through this ceremony and baptize, get someone baptized so that somebody can get to the place that you don't even believe exists? It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. He's just pointing that out, I believe. Okay. After that, I'll, I'll be, if you really want to get into it, we can talk about it more afterwards. But, um, but his point is, it, is, if there's no resurrection, then why do you do this? It's kind of like I would, I would point out the silliness of people who are like, I don't know if there's a God exists, da, 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 and then in a funeral going, he's in heaven. What? If there's no resurrection, and this is all there is, why, why are you even using that language? We're so inconsistent. The second thing, if there's no resurrection, he says, is that, is that why then do we endanger ourselves every hour? And he's talking about the apostles in particular. Why are so many people laying their lives down? Why are, you know, uh, there are thousands and thousands of Christians around the world that will die today or be persecuted today for their faith. Like, we're insulated from it, but it is happening all over the place. Families are being persecuted and there's, and there's deaths and imprisonments and, and wrongful stuff. Right. It makes no sense for them to do that if there's no resurrection, if there's nothing afterwards. And then Paul comes to the same conclusion that Peggy Lee did. Matter of fact, I would say he's first. And he says, if if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He actually embraces that philosophy. He's saying my life is stupidity if there's nothing after this is in essence what he's saying. There's a lot riding on that resurrection, isn't there? Yes, sir. And then he, then he kind of concludes this section with their, their, what their response should be. What should their response be? 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He says, do not be misled. And he quotes a common saying of the day, bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. So he gives them three directives in terms of the response. The, the first is stop being deceived. Stop being misled. Understand who you're hanging out with. And then he says this bad company corrupts good character. And again, that's a, that's a general saying of the, of, of the day. We might say, you know, you are who you hang out with. Might be another way of saying the same thing. And, and in other words, be careful who you follow. And I would say, if you're getting any major ideas, philosophy, advice from someone whose um, claim to fame is they have a lot of likes on social media, you would know nothing about their life, their character, uh, their commitment to God's work. You better be careful you're not being misled. I have to be careful that I'm not being misled. The secondly, he says, come to your senses. It literally means become sober-minded. Right? In other words, don't fall for the latest, this sounds so good. Right? All roads lead to God. Doesn't that sound so good? Right? All roads lead to God. Or, or, you know what, it, it doesn't really matter what you do or say as long as you're basically a good person. Sounds good. But wake up. If you really push these philosophies, if you really push the logic of some of these things, like you, everyone is random, we're just here randomly. If that is really true, push that logic. If it's just, this is all random, if this is all random, then why does it matter if I lay my life down for you, if I serve you? I can do that as long as it serves me, but it makes absolutely no sense if this is all random for me to worry about what's happening in Ukraine unless it affects me and only if it affects me. Otherwise, who cares if you really follow the philosophy? Now, I believe God cares and I believe we should care, but that's, I'm trying to be sober about it. 
rather than have all these kind of things in my life that don't, that don't line up with what I really truly believe. And then lastly, he just says, stop sinning. In other words, the road you're on, when you, when you stand in conflict of God's word, whatever the subject is, when you stand in conflict of God's word, you are sinning. You are outside of God's will, period. And, then, and he says about these people that are teaching that there's no resurrection, they're ignorant of God. And quite frankly, you should feel ashamed of following them. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, especially in my teen years, um, there are some folks that I follow that now I look back and I go, Ugh, I can't believe I listen to. I can't believe I base my life on. I can't believe. And there's shame. And that's in essence Paul saying, man. And I think a lot of us are going to stand before God and you're going to be tempted to say something that a philosophy that you embrace because it sounds good to you now. But when you're actually standing before the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the king of kings, all of a sudden your, your true, my true motivation is going to be clear. And I'm keeping my mouth shut. And I'll feel ashamed that I, that I ever allowed myself to fall for that kind of lie. And that's even without God saying you were wrong. I'll know that I was wrong. So to kind of tie this all up, let me just ask and answer this final question. Is there life after death? And is it even important? Obviously, I'm going to say yes, there's life after death. That's the whole point. There is life after death. And, and I, would, I would also point out a few things. Sometimes I think we do a disservice to each other in the world when we paint this picture of, of we're sitting on a cloud with a harp and a worship service 24-7. Okay. The vision that we get of eternity is at two points, Genesis, paradise, and Revelation, the grand city. In paradise, they ate, they drank, they interacted, they had physical bodies. In the city, it, it's a city. How does the city run? There's commerce, there's, there's, there's a life to live. Now, will we have a worship service? I'm, I'm sure we will. Absolutely sure that there will be some time for that. But is that all there is? Absolutely, positively not. That's, the Bible does not paint that kind of spiritual picture. And I, for one, am quite happy about that. So the second part of this is, why is it important? And I can sum that up in one word, hope. Hope. Hope and purpose, maybe. It's, it's important because following Christ, the worship team can kind of come up as I conclude this, following Christ takes a commitment. It takes a commitment, which means saying no to some things that you want to say yes to. It, it, it means serving people that you'd rather not serve, giving things away that you'd rather not give away, and, and making some things more important than your own personal happiness. And the only real reason, some of those things, you'll, you'll, you'll actually get more out of it than if you didn't do those things. So I'll, I'll admit to you, if you take a Saturday and you go down to the mission and you serve food, you'll feel good that you, t initially like, oh, I got to get up early, da, 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 da. But at the end of the time, you'll feel good about yourself, which is why there's a lot of churches out there that don't believe in Jesus that teach good works, because there is some, a positive benefit. But I, this, is, this I will tell you, as soon as the mission calls you and you have something better to do, you will say no. The only reason to say yes in that case is because you believe by saying no to this thing that I have better to do than to just sprinkle it in. Because everybody, even those who don't follow God, sprinkle it in and feel good about themselves. Is, is that sure hope that I will stand before the Father and the Father will see what nobody else saw. And that is, I had a terrible week. I would better have been served sleeping in. I had an opportunity to hang out with my granddaughter who's been gone for two weeks. And I said no to all that so that I could serve the least of these because I believe I want to hear from Jesus someday, well done, good and faithful servant, that only he sees. And, and that is why it's important because it gives us hope. You know what, what is interesting? I'm going to close with this, this kind of idea. What's interesting to me is, you've heard me say this before, 
I've met people who they were at church, God changed their lives, and, um, and, and life got better for them. It got, it, meaning came. And then they hit a tough spot. And this happens a lot. God initially blesses you and, and the roads are made smooth as he's kind of wooing himself and, and, and you're learning about him. But then he, he lets life happen. And notice, I want you to notice what Paul's saying here. Paul is not, you cannot say what Paul's teaching here is, you know what? If you just believe in Jesus, everything will go great. All you need to do is give and he will be given. It's not his philosophy. His philosophy is hard. It's tough. It's persecution. So that happens to them. And then they walk away. But here's the thing. As I run into them three months, six months, a year later, and how are you doing? Da, 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 right? And they're like, well, you know, the church thing's really not for me. Da, da, da. And then they start talking about their life. The joy is gone. That, that hope is gone. And part of me just wants, I don't usually say this because I don't think it would have an effect and it would sound rude. But deep down, I want to say to you, if what you're saying is true, I think I would continue pretending. Because when you were pretending, when you were believing something that you now think maybe is not true, you felt better about life and yourself and your future and the world than now when you're quote, quote unquote enlightened. Why? Because enlightenment leads to hopelessness. Because this is all there is. This is all there is. But genuine faith in Christ not only leads uh, to hope, but it ultimately will lead to a resurrection. Amen?